Now, hmm, I'm sorry, this is, this is going to be a little sobering, a little sobering. And uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be at church. It's good. To, the fellowship, I can't tell you how amazing it is. And you, for those of you that haven't been very long, you have no idea how much this means to some of us to just see you here enjoying, uh, enjoying the Bible, enjoying church, enjoy, the kids enjoying serving. That, that's not normal for most Christians. That's not normal in today's day and age. And I want you to treat that, I want you to see that as something special. I want you to uh, cherish this. Because the truth is, uh, the church, you know what Sunday service is? It's a picture of the rapture. It's a picture of Jesus Christ just taking you out of the world, taking you from all the troubles, all the, all the sorrow, all the stress, all the worries, and just for two or three hours, you can just enjoy fellowship with God, enjoy peace, enjoy comfort, enjoy uh, fe- uh, each other's company. And it is a valuable thing, especially today. I mean, you, listen, you know what I'm going to preach on today, but I want to just introduce to you some ideas here. You know, if you've seen the news lately, and I hope, I don't watch the news, okay? The fact that I heard of that, heard of this thing going on, it means that it's getting out there, all right? And if you've seen the news lately, it seems that with each passing day, things are getting crazier and crazier. As time goes on, this illusion of normality is being gradually lifted off of us. All right. It seems like we're starting to enter these strange, strange times. We're like strangers in a strange land. Okay. I mean, when we are singing that hymn, this world is not my home. I mean that literally. This world is not my home. I mean, even now, compared to even five years ago, it's an entirely different landscape. Kids, you might not remember this, but five years ago, things were a lot more balanced. Things were a lot more normal. And even then, they were still crazy. I mean, I grew up in the early 2000s and uh, the 90s. I grew up in a time where you could, you, you, a little kid could walk outside by himself unsupervised. You know, as long as you come home before eight, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, whatever, you know, go, go do what you want. What's that? Before you got dark. Right. Just get home before it gets dark. But now it's always dark. Now you don't know, uh, you can't let your child go out unsupervised or you get arrested. See, the times we live in, this is not normal. And I want you kids to get this. What you're going through right now is something almost hardly anyone in the past has had to go through. Okay? And it's almost like we're living in a different country. And adults, you need to just... Be aware of this. All right. You and your family and your loved ones and your kids, you're going to be experiencing some things that you might not have ever thought you'd have to experience. And sure, you know, as time goes on and the environment changes, faith is getting harder and harder to have nowadays. Sure, we've always had obstacles to face in this Laodicean church age. The devil has mightily mightily used his devices to try and keep us from having faith. I mean, and he's used it, all right? He, the devil has used evolution, all right? He's used the dinosaurs. You know, you, you believe in the dinosaur bones, right? Well, then how do you believe in God? You know, the devil's used a lot of things to keep you from believing what this book says. The devil has used, I mean, and, and it keeps, he keeps adding more and more to that. I mean, global warming, global warming. You know, you know what the, the, the devil has used global, global warming for? The devil has used global warming to try and get you to think, oh no, the, the whole world's gonna be destroyed. We need to start doing all these, uh, implementing all these laws and all these, uh, greener efficiency, uh, cars and all this stuff. And it's trying to distract you from what God is going to do. You know, this world is not long, okay? This world is gonna eventually, God's gonna put it to an end and he's gonna make a new one. See? You gotta stop worrying about global warming, alright? They, they, they keep saying that the sea levels are rising. Alright, how long have you lived in San Diego for? Almost 30 years? Has the sea level risen? No. Hey, if the sea level was rising, we would have drowned by now. 
All right. It's not a threat, but the government and the, and the world system is trying to discourage you from having faith and trying to put fear in you and fear in you and fear in you. So you stop worrying about the things of God and start worrying about the things of this world. The Bible says that God has not given you the spirit of fear. Then who's doing it? The devil. I mean, it goes even further. Now the, the, now the wonder is like quantum theory, you know, or like simulation. Do we live in a hologram? All this crazy stuff you hear from respected professors and scientists. You know, Elon Musk is talking about living in a simulation. Or you got to start worrying about the AI. And let me tell you something. You know, there is stuff that you should be looking out for. I'm not saying there is no danger. But what I'm saying is, what does God say about it? What should your main prerogative be? Should you be worried more about what the world is trying to push down your throat? Or should you be worried more about the things of this book? Okay, so the devil has continued to use these things to create a disparity. All right, if you as a Christian don't believe in global warming, guess what? Now there's a disparity. Now the world thinks you're crazy. Now the world thinks you're a nut. And now the world thinks that you're in a cult. When they're the ones following the devil's system and they're the ones that are falling hook, line, and sinker for what the devil is about to pull on the world. What? What's his goal? What's his end game? You see, either you fall into the world system and start to believe all the lies, or you're forced to make a stand and face ridicule and face opposition and persecution because you won't play their game. See, I mean, this happened two years ago with COVID or three years ago. See how quickly the time moves? Today is no exception. All right. Now we're, it seems like the devil's always changing the game, but the game always stays the same. Okay. Today is just a little bit different. However, you see with all the things I just listed, they've all been leading up to this next big doozy, so to speak, this next big obstacle to your faith. Because the devil is always trying to throw those fiery darts at your faith. That's why you need the shield of faith to cover yourself, to make sure you don't get hit by those things. You know, evolution or, or, or uh, uh, AI or the simulation or, or global warming, you need that shield of faith to realize that things are going to be okay. you got to stop worrying about that. But things are changing. The next big leap that the devil has taken the world uh, uh, taken the world in order to prepare for the coming of his son, the Antichrist. The next big leap before the tribulation is, listen, this isn't an episode of the X-Files, okay? This is, this, this is government admitting this, that there is alien life. Alien life. Now, raise your hand if you believe that there is something out there, something out there that's not human. I mean, you don't have to get like... Uh, you don't have to get too into the details. I understand what those things are and what they aren't. But listen, I think there's something out there. Now, I want to get over, go over what those things are and what you should do about it. See, our government, our media, our space program have been disclosing on the record the reality of foreign life forms visiting Earth. Whatever was normal to you last week, be prepared for that to change. Whatever, whatever you thought was just, you know, you go home, you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you brew a cup of coffee, you drive to work and you go work and you come back, you watch the kids, you go make dinner and you go to sleep. And that's normal to you. But are you prepared to live in a world where there might be something out there and, and, and this is no longer uh, secretive, it's out in the open? Are you prepared to live in a world like that? Whatever was normal to you, that's quickly on its way out. And now you must prepare for what may come. Okay? And this message is not to discourage you. It's not to scare you. It's to prepare you and to keep your, help you to keep your faith. The title of this message is three things every Christian must do before the alien apocalypse. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I realize this is a strange message, Lord, but you have a strange book. And Father, it has some strange things that, that are uh, going to teach us on this strange topic, Lord. And we believe the Bible is not silent on this. And Lord, I just pray that you would give me wisdom and give these people a heart to hear this hard saying, Lord. 
Uh, this is a message that if you preached it 50 years ago, you would have been branded a nut job, Lord. But now with what's going on in our, in our world, Lord, this is becoming open in the air and relevant and people are, are believing it. So Lord, I pray that this message would help these Christians here not to be, uh, surprised, not to be discouraged, but to be encouraged in the Lord to continue in good works until Christ comes. Lord, we pray that you bless this message. Get me out of the flesh. Cover our sins in the blood. And Lord, move with the Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now the first point I want to bring to you, all right, the three things you got to do. Number one, you have to know your enemy. Know your enemy. So before I can go any further, I just want you to understand that, like I said, a message like this, if I preached this 50 years ago, you would have thought I was a nut job. You would have thought I had a tinfoil hat on and you would have thought like, man, what's this guy on? Is this really what church is about? But I mean, hey, listen, they're already admitting to it. The world is already admitting what, whatever these things are, they're not human. All right, NASA said it on live television, CBS. This wasn't like Alex Jones or anything. This was like actual, you know, wor- people, like world, world rulers and shakers admitting something here. So we can, we can at least preach this without feeling like, you know, you're going to think I'm crazy. Because listen, they're already confirming it. And I want to tell you something. The Bible is not silent on this issue. Yeah, this Bible is more relevant to you today than it ever has in your life before. And the Bible is always ahead of science, and it's continued to show us time and time again that today is no different. The truth is that if God's children were facing an enemy like alien life forms, space invaders, that would cause many of us to fall away, wouldn't it? That would cause many of us to consider, like, maybe the Bible is wrong, because I I don't know where it's at. The Bible doesn't say anything about aliens. It doesn't say anything about little green men with big eyes that are abducting people. Or does it? Does it? See, I'm here today to tell you, thankfully, that the Bible has a lot to say about this. And uh, the Bible tells us a lot about what's happening to our, wor- our world and the mysterious enemy that we're facing. This, uh, the thing is, you can know this enemy. This isn't something that the Bible is silent about. This Bible is the answer to all of our problems. It is the roadmap to success. This Bible, what's, I, what's it say? Basic instructions before leaving earth. We, we ain't gonna, this world is not our home. We're leaving pretty soon. But we need instructions before we leave. You might say this. Well, how do you even know that these extraterrestrials, if that's what you want to call them, how do you even know, preacher, that they are your enemies? Maybe God always intended for there to be other life forms, for man to fellowship with outside in space. Maybe, well, maybe, my friend, maybe they're not. That that way of thinking, that thinking of, well, you know, maybe the Bible isn't your answer to everything. That idea that maybe they're our friends. That, I, that way of thinking is unscriptural and it's rooted in satanic doctrine and humanism. The idea goes like this, all right? This is where they're coming from, Christians that say that. I mean, there's trillions and trillions and tr- I think there's like 600 sextillion stars out there that we know of in space. And their reasoning, it has a logic to it. Like, well, listen, there has to be life out there in space. There's so much out there. How can we possibly be the only ones here? All right. And if you don't really think about it, that makes sense. The problem is that God has always been selective. He's, he's always chosen one man, one book, one faith. He's always chosen one group of people. He's always called out one individual. He always, he chose one savior. He chose one body of Christ. He, God is discriminant. He doesn't just say, all right, everyone in the, in the universe, you all get a planet. You all get a, a, a faith. You all get a religion. You know, that's not how God works. That's humanism. That, that's, wh- where does that line of thinking come from? Evolution. The idea that there's so much out there, life had to evolve on other different planets, right? I mean, that's what they think. Now, we know as Bible believers that evolution is a scam. It's not true. But there's Christians out there that believe in evolution. 
surprisingly. And, you know, while these ways of thinking on the surface, they may seem harmless, but the truth is that this is rooted in man's desire to reach the heavens on his own power and not God's. You know, they never want to give credit to God. You know, they would rather have alien life forms come down there and give them the way into heaven. Really? Yeah. You heard of the Tower of Babel? What do you think happened there? And... Uh, if, we under, if we're to understand these beings as God intends, because I'm not denying that there's something that's not human out there. But what I'm denying is the idea that these are, these are good, created beings, that they come in peace. No. I believe that if we're to understand what these things are, what you may at, at one point be exposed to, you need to know what the Bible says about it. So the next thing you need to know about knowing your enemy is you need to know, I just contradicted myself, but your enemy is coming in peace. Really? Let me show you something. Uh, with, with what's been going on in the news regarding UFOs and aliens, we're left wondering how soon is it going to be before we see these creatures reveal themselves to us? You know, I, I'll be honest with you. If I saw an alien on TV, like nationally publicized, I'd at least be taken aback. I'd at least be a little surprised. I'm not, I'm not saying I wouldn't, but I wouldn't be uh, shocked. I would know what those things are. See, uh, but the thing is, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what will they look like? Where do they come from? What do they, and what do they want? And the way we get the answer is we need to read the Word of God. We need to see what the Word of God has to say about visitors from outer space. Does the Bible say anything about that? Turn with me to Genesis 6. You don't have to turn very far to see what the Bible says about visitors from outer space. Now, some preface here. All right, doctrinal teaching. How many heavens are there? There's three. Really? Okay, let me explain this to you. There's three heavens. Now, there's the, fir- there's the, hev- the third heaven... Apostle Paul speaks of it in the book of Corinthians, where he was caught up into the third heaven. That's where God is. That's where God's throne is. Heaven. All right, but now there's a second heaven. There's a second heaven where the book of Genesis says the stars are. That's outer space. And then the first heaven, the book of Genesis also says where the birds fly. That would be, that would be the sky. So there's three heavens. Three heavens, okay? You need to understand that. So, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Genesis 6, verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when man began to mul- men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he hath made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. All right. So here we see that the sons of God came unto the daughters of men. What's that mean? Who are the sons of God? There is an idea out there by other independent fundamental or fundamental Baptists. They believe that those sons of God are merely just a, the godly line of Shem. The godly line of Shem. You know uh, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? What's that? Japheth. Yeah, that's what I said. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So they, they believe it's the godly line. I'm sorry, did I say Shem, by the way? It's the godly line of Seth. Godly line of Seth. That's what they think it is. That's Adam's son, the one that wasn't Cain or Abel. Uh, 
So they think that this godly line of Seth intermingled with the ungodly line of Ham. Now that's a private interpretation. And you want to know how I know that? Because these sons of God, when they came in unto the daughters of men, they produced giants. It don't matter how godly you are, if you produce a child, you ain't getting a giant from it. You're not getting mighty men, men of old, men of renown. These are like the X-Men, you know? These guys are like super beings. It doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter what your line is. You're not making that kind of creature. So I want to go over to you what these sons of God are. These sons of God. See, because this is going to give us a better understanding on what these things in space are. And I'm not saying that these aliens are the sons of God. All right, let's get that straight right now. But keep your hand in Genesis. Go to Job, the book of Job, 1.6. We're doing a doctrinal teaching for right now, and we'll get more into preaching in a second, in a, in a couple minutes. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6. I'll give you a second. Now, just some preface here. Um, I, I remember I told you that there's three heavens, okay? Three heavens. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So there, Satan and these sons of God are in direct company with God. Where could that be? Go to chapter 2. I'm sorry, Verse 7, I mean, first, first, let's read verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So he's, not on, he, he's saying, I just came from the earth. So if he just came from it, then where would he be? Verse, chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So here they are again in direct company with God. Now go to uh, J Psalm, I'm sorry, Job 38. This will really clinch it, that these sons of God are not human. They're not human. Job 38, verse 7. You know, verse 6, verse 6. Now, this passage is talking about the creation of the earth, the creation of the earth when God made it. And it says here in verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So these sons of God were there before the earth. What could they be? Well, let me show you what they are. Let me show you exactly what these sons of God were. They weren't men. They weren't normal. They could breed super beings and giants. These had to be something supernatural. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 on one hand and Jude, chap, uh, Jude 1. 2 Peter chapter 2. That's in your New Testament. Chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. And Jude. Now I'm going to read Jude first. That Jude is the second to last book in your Bible. Just before the book of Revelation. And it says here in verse 6, we're going to use the Bible to define what these beings were. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of, that, of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So the Bible says that these beings, these angels, which kept not their first estate, heaven, they came down and guess what? They intermingled, intermingled. Now, Second Peter, I'm going to be going back to this, by the way, so maybe keep a bookmark on Jude. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but, came them, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of, of the ungodly. So we know that Genesis 6 is right before the flood. These angels, right before Noah uh, went on that boat, they were intermingling with man. 
Okay? So we understand that these sons of gods are angels. But does that mean they're the aliens? Well, it... So this is where I'm going to start to get more into theory and speculation, okay? Understand this. I'm not saying this as a hard doctrinal fact now, okay? But I'm asking you the question because you need to understand that if you're going to... There's a chance you might see something soon. There's a chance. And I don't want you to be completely put... Like, I don't know what the Bible says about... I don't want you to be completely put off and scared. So that's why I'm presenting this to you. The question I'm asking you is, are those sons of God the aliens? Well, as we define it today, no. Angels in the Bible always appear as men. Always. They don't appear as women with wings. They don't believe, they don't appear as little flying naked babies with a little cupid or anything like that. They don't appear with halos over their heads. They appear as men. We don't have time to get into that teaching, but just understand that an angel is always in the appearance of a man. The Bible says that you may have entertained angels unaware. So the thing is, you could have met an angel in the past and never even realized it. How can that be unless they appear just like a normal person, a normal man? Okay, so I don't think these angels that have fallen are appearing as little green men. Or, or reptilians, or you know, because if you you can go down the whole conspiracy theory, there's different kinds of uh, classes of alien life forms apparently, with the reptilians, with the greys, with the Nordics, with the uh, there's all different kinds. See, and if we're to believe what these secondhand ca- cases are saying, they, they don't they're not angels, fallen or otherwise. So what could they be? First, know this. That these creatures that we're apparently going to make contact with at some point, the Bible doesn't say God created them, all right? There's distinct classes, or there's distinct forms of life that God created, all right? You have the men, God created man, God created the angels, God created the ser- seraphim, the cherubim. He created celestial animals, you know, like when Jesus Christ comes down from heaven uh, to, on a horse, celestial animals, But we never hear about little green men. We never hear about big-headed, black-eyed aliens. So we must speculate. The Bible says this in John 1. It's the aliens. The Bible says this in John 1. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made... uh, by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So God created the heavens and the earth and he created everything in the beginning. The thing is in the beginning. So whatever these things are, God didn't make them in the beginning. They had to have come up from something or somewhere. Okay. So again, we're speculating here. The theory is this. Go back to Genesis 6. Notice this. Did God create the giants? No. How did the giants come to being then? God never said, I'm going to make giants in the earth. They came from the sons of God intermingling with the daughters of men. And they created these giants, these mighty men, these men of renown. And now I'm already starting to guess where you might be going. Well, well, you know, giants are exist in real life. The Bible says these were mighty men, giants. A real person that is born with a gig- giganticism, that's a disability. It's not mightiness or anything. Okay? You know, there's a, these people don't live very long. So what am I getting at here? What am I getting at here? These giants, these mighty men, these men of renown, they, God did not make them. They are bastard life forms. All right? Now, if, you, if you, this is your first time coming here, you might think, well, man, I've never heard of preacher talk about aliens before i've never heard a preacher talk about bastard life forms that are made from you know this sounds crazy but the government is owning up to this now this has always been brewing i'm just showing you what the bible says about it now again we're speculating here we're speculating here notice how the giants in genesis 6 notice how they create these weird life forms They were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, okay? So 
now go down to verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. Notice how God didn't just judge man. He judges man and beast. Well, why would God judge the beast too? I mean, there, weren't the angels only intermingling with men? No. You see, this is why we're Bible believers. This is why we look at every word, because every word was put there by God for a reason. Look at the wording. Verse 3, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh. I'm sorry, go to, go to uh, um, Jude. Go back to Jude. Remember I told you to put a bookmark there? Jude 6. I'm sorry, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. What's that word strange mean in the Bible? Strange in the Bible means foreign. It means different. All right. So there's, there's actually the Bible teaches that there's different kinds of flesh. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of uh, one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, and another of birds. See, so there's different kinds of flesh. So why would God judge the entire earth, not just man? It's because the angels, the fallen angels, were intermingling with all flesh, all flesh, and they were giving after different kinds of bastard life forms. These things that God never made. You know why God told, uh, God told uh, uh, the Jews to kill all the giants? It's because they're not of God. God didn't make them. A giant wasn't saved. Giants couldn't be just regenerated or, or, be, or be born again or be saved in the Old Testament. They couldn't be saved. God wanted them gone. They were an abomination. They were continual enemies to God's people. So though, that strange flesh, I mean, listen, that was like bestiality. Did you know the Levitical law in the Old Testament for bestiality is you kill, you, you kill both the perpetrator and the animal. You judge both. Guess what? When God judged the earth, the, the, he flooded both people and the animal. See, we compare scripture with scripture. Now, again, I'm postulating the idea that these angels intermingled not just with men, but with Animals. Do you want evidence of that, though? You know, this Bible is more... This Bible is... It is stranger than you'll ever think. This Bible, it speaks of, a, as a matter of fact, about dragons. You know, there's unicorns in the Bible. You know, there's satyrs. You know, raise your hand if you know what a satyr is. A satyr is like a half goat, half man. By the way, a little interesting note. What is a Baphomet? Goathead. Isn't that strange? But the Bible speaks of these not as if they're like mythical creatures, like they're, uh, like they're just like, no, they're not, they're just legends. No, the Bible speaks of them as a matter of fact. You can read the book of Isaiah if you want. Uh, what about a cockatrice? You know what a cockatrice is? A cockatrice is like a half rooster, half snake. These are weird things that like God made that? No. These might be products of the sons of God intermingling with all flesh. All flesh. Now, again, I, I'm telling you this not to be, make you think like, you know, this is like doctrinal fact. I'm, I'm telling you this because if we see something in the news about these strange life forms, I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to be falling away from the faith because you see something that you thought the Bible was silent on. The Bible is not silent on this. <clears throat> so again, what if these bastardized life forms... What if these irredeemable abominations to God are vessels for demonic spirits to indwell? You mean, is there a verse on that? Let me show you that the devil's spirits, foul spirits, can indwell people and animals. Let me show you. Go with me to Mark 5. Mark 5. Who knows about legion? Legion. 
You probably didn't think you'd be getting this kind of preaching today. (laughs) Mark 5. Mark 5. Verse 8 to 13. For time's sake, I'll be reading it now. If you can't turn there in time, uh, just uh, write it down. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So here we see that demonic spirits can indwell men and can indwell animals. You know, angels don't indwell you, all right? A, A foul spirit is not the same as an angel. They're different. But these physical, these, uh, an angel can be, can manifest physically, by the way. They're spirit beings, but they can manifest in the physical realm. A spirit, however, cannot. Devils, the only devil that can manifest himself physically is Satan himself. Anytime you see a devil, a spirit, a foul spirit in the Bible, it has to possess something first. Okay? Now, again, if we're to see these evil creatures, these aliens, The only thing we could scripturally assume is that they're demonic, devilish spirits indwelling some sort of bastard life form. Okay? Now, again, this isn't something for you to plant your flag on. And, you know, if you don't believe this, you're a heretic. I'm just telling you this in case something happens in the future where you might be shooken up. Okay? We can only theorize about this at some point. And, again, is 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 this even rooted in reality? We already know that man is experimenting with chimeras. You know what a chimera is? And this is like when you gene splice animals with animals. This is a science fact. Man is trying to play God. So don't be shocked when something happens. So again, I wanted to preface all that. I wanted to give you all that now so that we can go on to the next point. Okay? Now the three things every Christian needs to be doing before the alien apocalypse. One is know your enemy. Now, number two is know, uh, know what to expect. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm sorry, did I say, is that 1 Timothy? 2 Timothy. Second Timothy. So I want to bring you back down to earth. And full disclosure, I, I don't know if we're going to see these things. I hope we don't. I hope we never have to see uh, uh, this, this wicked, evil life form leading millions and billions of people astray because they think that the, al- the, the aliens are coming in peace. Because that's what they're going to think. They're going to think these aliens are going to come and they're going to give us all sorts of technology and they're going to get rid of all the borders between man and, and, and it's going to be peace, peace at last. And I hope we don't have to see that. We're not going to go through the tribulation. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, one thing I know for a fact is this. Go with me to Galatians 1, 8, uh, 1. Keep your hand in Timothy. I know. It's our main text, but I want to show you this. Galatians 1. Keep your hand in Timothy. The Bible is not silent on if we see angels. If we see uh, angels coming down to earth, or maybe postulating if we maybe even see these aliens, these devils. Galatians 1, 6. Paul says this, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel or an angel or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Apostle Paul, this is Christian doctrine. This is what Paul told us, the church age. So if we see an angel from heaven preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. Don't be shaken up in your faith. We have the truth. Now you can go back to Timothy. So one thing I know for a fact is that we are in the last days. 
This is it, all right? Normal's not coming back. This is the end. And you need to prepare for it. I charge thee, I'm sorry, verse three. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away." For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does that sound like today? Does that sound like an average day in Imperial Beach? That's today. The Bible says we're in the last days, and the Bible says this is the perilous times. This is a time of great peril if you're a Christian. No, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you may be losing your faith. And I want you to be expecting the unexpected. If you need help knowing if we're in the last days or not, listen, we just went over uh, seven verses that dials it down to a T. We know this is what the scripture was talking about. And I want you to understand Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Don't turn with me there just for time's sake. Don't turn with me there. I'm going to cut this short today, and I'm going to continue again, but I want to get one, a couple more last points. Matthew 24, verse 36. We know that the last days are here. And because we know that, we know the rapture's coming. And guess what? As we approach the rapture, realize this. We're getting closer and closer to the tribulation, too. Who knows what the game of chicken is? You know, you're, you're, gonna, you're driving off a cliff and whoever stops first is the loser. Well, you're getting closer and closer to that cliff. And you're getting closer and it looks like you're going to go off of it. But guess what? Hold on. You're gonna, God is going to save you from the tribulation. But it's going to start looking more and more like you're going to go off that cliff. Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39 says this. But of that day and hour, no man knoweth no man and... Uh, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah, that's Noah, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we know as the tribulation is approaching, it's going to look more and more like the days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? We just read it. Genesis 6, the sons of God came down. Now, I'm not saying we're going to see the sons of God come down, but what I am saying is that things might start to look more and more like we're going to go through the tribulation, but we're not. Hold fast to the faith. You know, expect the unexpected. You know, Revelation chapter 12 we see space invaders coming down to earth. We see space invaders coming down to earth in the tribulation, the angels. But we know as Bible believers, we're not going to go through that. But we should expect the, set, the system to be set up. We should expect to be gradually eased into this tribulation time period. Okay? And what we should expect more of all, most of all is that Jesus is coming. Amen? Things might look dark and they might look bleak. This message is not to discourage you, but to wake you up and to set things into perspective. The world that you thought you lived in was just an illusion. We aren't fighting against the new world government. We aren't fighting against this new world order. order. We're not fighting against Biden. We're not fighting against COVID. We're fighting, as the Bible says, we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. All right. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5. Don't turn there for time's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice that use of the word imaginations. Remember in Genesis 6? Remember in Genesis 6, God is casting down imaginations. You know, man is always trying to come up with new things in his imagination against God. Genesis 6, Genesis 6, and verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, we, we need to stop coming... We need to stop putting up with these vain imaginations. You know, oh, the aliens, they come in peace. Oh, you know, evolution is real. Oh, you know, the, the, the uh, AI is going to take over the world and all this stuff. Stop dealing with that. You're dealing with spirits here. And you need to start looking for that blessed hope and stop looking at the negative. Stop looking at uh, all the conspiracy theories and all the things. Like, Sure, they might be true, but the Bible tells us to be babes concerning that which is evil. We need to be more wise concerning the things of God. We have Bible believers that care more about their the, all the little intricacies of the doctrine, but they don't apply the doctrine meaningfully in their lives. They're hearers of the word, but they're not doing it. We need more practical Christians. We need Christians that are looking towards that blessed hope. And you want to know how you find comfort in these last days? You want to know how you find peace? It's not through your finances. It's not through your intellect. It's not through your ability. The only way you can find comfort in these last days is found here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'll end, I'll end things here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the only way to have comfort if you're a Christian. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Watch it here. Wherefore? Comfort one another with these words. We are not going to go through the tribulation. It might look like things will be bleak. It might look like things are going to be dark. Like you might be surprised as if something came out of nowhere and shook your faith. But you're to be comforted by the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come down from heaven and he's going to rapture his church out of here. Amen? So don't be shaken. Though an angel from heaven come down and preach another gospel, you know your orders. You know what to do. Plans haven't changed. All right? You're not going to go and change things up now. Remember when, maybe you don't remember, but when Y2K happened, the churches, guess what? They were all starting to leave. I can't go to institute. I got to go out there now and save whoever I can now. And guess what? Y2K didn't happen. Now is not the time to overreact. Now is not the time to go out into the woods and live up in the, in the mountains like some loser on YouTube, okay? Now is not the time to do that. Now is the time to keep going to church, to keep spreading the gospel, to keep dwelling together, letting the word, word of God dwell richly in your heart. Now is the time to continue in the faith, to hold fast to that which is good, and to comfort each other, to be together, to love one another, to spread the gospel. I'm praying that you're not going to be shaken by what's to come. And more importantly, I'm praying that Jesus Christ comes soon. Because I don't want to be here for when that tribulation happens. Because man, the one thing you should know is you got to get saved. If you're not saved, Lord help you. Because the tribulation is way worse than what we're going to face. And if you're not saved, if you're not 100% sure you're saved, approach one of us after service. Come come up to one of us. We can tell you how to receive Jesus Christ so you don't have to be scared of what's to come. I pray that this message was a blessing to you.